So let's focus on visual, visual perception. Look at the image right here on the right. Now, in terms of sensation, some photons are reflected from that image, hit your retina, and are producing a certain pattern of neural activations of electrochemical signals. Now, visual perception means taking this pattern and turning it into a meaningful representation and understanding of what is pictured. In order to achieve this, you need to do a number of things. To the very minimum, you need to segment the image, which means you need to find the lines and divide up the image into different, you know, different objects in the image, different region within the image. Then, you, of course, you need to understand what is in the foreground, what is in the background, what is close to you, what is far away from you. So where are objects in space? And finally, you need to take certain lines, magically combine them together, so that you, they actually form a meaningful object. Not only they, they form a meaningful object, they actually form a meaningful object that you then are able to recognize and to understand that you know, it's, it's a shoe, it's a hat, the door. But it turns out that achieving this is actually a pretty complicated feat. So for example, let's look at image segmentation. Now, generally you can think of image segmentation, you could take a very bottom up approach. Uh, for example, look at the image down here. It takes an instant for you to tell exactly that there's a child right here, that she's holding a flower, there's a background, there's some shrubs back in the background, and you can even see um, that her uh, shoulder is closer to you than is her face, for example. And, and not only, there are some parts of her face that are occluded. For example, you can't see her, you can fully see her right eye, but you know that it's just because this, these hair are occluding the eye. This does mean that you must have successfully been able somehow to realize that some lines here are um, come from the hair. Other lines, even though they overlap with the hair, are actually from ob objects behind them, like her, eye, her right eye. So imagine how would you do this with a computer? Well, you could do, uh, what you see on the right, which is simply try to find what are the boundaries. And maybe, maybe based on those boundaries, may, based on those edges, you can reconstruct what's in the image. And so if you see here, um, you can see that what happens mainly is that we managed to segment pretty well the foreground from the background. I suspect it's a trick of the fact that the background has been blurred by the camera lens. But it's very clear that we managed to pull, pull out the foreground from the background. What we haven't really managed to do, at least in this segmentation, is to tell apart the child from, for example, the flower. If you, if you focus on her, on her hands, it's pretty hard to tell which lines are the flower and which, hand, which lines are her hands. The same is true here with the, uh, with the hair. Kind of all these lines overlap. Look at the lines of the hair and the eye and her nose. They all overlap. So it's, it's hard from this rendering to tell apart what is what. You, however, you had no problem extracting what's happening. So, so far, we've only spoken about bottom-up processes, which means certain patterns, uh, photons hit our retina, produce certain, cat, certain patterns of um, electrochemical signals. And from that, our brain has a flow to try to reconstruct what might be out there. Then you have applied the top-down knowledge to it. For example, as I said earlier, even though you can see it here, you can see some small lines, such as those that would make this, and you can just assume that that means that there's an eye right behind it, right? So there you're using your top-down knowledge of what a face usually look like, your top-down knowledge of, of the behavior of hair and their position with respect to the face. And you've done that in order to understand and recognize the objects that are in this picture. Now, once you manage to segment an image and you manage to extract lines uh, from the image, you need a way to bring these lines together in a coherent um, and meaningful manner to create objects. Um, now, once again, our brains appear to come into this world equipped with specific uh, principles and biases in order to accomplish this. 
Now, in the 1900s, between Germany and Austria, the so-called Gestalt School of Psychology developed, and they were particularly interested in exactly this phenomenon. In fact, they were particularly interested uh, in trying to isolate what are the principles around which our minds seem to uh, organize coherently um, uh, edges and, and lines and, and visual sensation. Now, the underlying principle um, of this approach, in fact, law, as the Gestalt uh, school used to refer um, to these, the, or, the, the, the key uh, point of view is the so-called law of pregnancy. It's the idea that we tend, so we have a, a principle in our mind, a, a bias, an inclination, we tend to perceive any visual array in a way that most simply organizes all the different elements into a stable and coherent form. Take, for example, um, the flag, the Olympic flag that you're seeing here in the image on the top right. Now, typically, when people see that, what they tend to see um, is five interlinked um, circles of different colors, which is exactly what you see portrayed under in A. People just tend to see five different uh, circles. You could, of course, perceive five sort of quasi-circular shapes with sort of some, some part of it cut off and four little slices in between. You could, right? That's the whole point of computational complexity. This image here could probably be explained in an infinity of possible ways. Computational complexity. Once again, our minds have developed guiding principles that allow us to infer what is most likely to be out there, even in the face of infinite possibility and tremendous computational complexity. Now, the Gestalt School developed a number uh, of different principles. One thing they were very interested at is uh, the idea of how do you segment what is in the foreground from what is in the background. And what you're seeing here on the right is a typical example of that. You'll notice this is a bistable image uh, and according to how uh, you stabilize it, um, either the foreground is the white, which means you see something like a, a, a vase uh, that is popping out in white on a, on a purple background, or the foreground is the purple, where you see two faces uh, in profile and silhouettes looking at each other, and the white is just the background behind the faces. Now, of course, an interesting question is, how do you accomplish this? How does your mind automatically, whichever you saw of these two first, your mind automatically decided what was, uh, what was popping out and what was in the background? Well, uh, the Gestalt School um, thought there were a number of different principles um, that seem to be particularly important in order to segment um, images into figure and ground. Um, for example, on the left, convexity seems to be a principle. So when there's a shape that is convex, that um, our minds just tend to perceive convex figures, convex patterns as making figures, as making foreground objects, as opposed to background objects. So the contention is that in these two squares on the left, you tend, not necessarily always, but you tend to spontaneously the triangle as the object and the rest as the background. Symmetry is another principle. This one refers to the tendency to assign a figure ground in a way such that the resultant figure has, is, has, has symmetry to it uh, along uh, some, um, some central axis. For example, focus on uh, the, the middle figure on the top. I tend to see this as, for example, this one and this one, I tend to see them as two pine trees. And you notice that they are symmetrical along, their, um, along the middle. I tend to see these two as turquoise uh, pine trees on a background of purple. Of course, you could have seen these as four thunders on a background, uh, as four purple thunders on a background of turquoise. But at least for me, and I want to guess for most of you, the foreground here appear to be these, these two uh, pine trees and this, whatever it is, wedding cake or whatever that might be. 
Conversely, if you look at the bottom image in the center, same thing. Now it's the purple that is the foreground and, and the, the two pine trees and the, and the wedding cake. Um, and the turquoise is the background. Of course, I can, I can focus on this and, and you can do. I can focus on this and then try really hard to interpret it as four thunders, but I have to, I have to focus and concentrate to do that. Spontaneously, I see down here the purple as being the foreground. Finally, uh, the principle of area uh, or smaller region is a principle by which the smaller of two overlapping objects is typically interpreted as being the figure and the larger object is interpreted as being background. So in the top area, you might be tempted to see these three turquoise, turquoise lines as the foreground on a purple background, vice versa down here, you probably see three purple lines as a foreground on a background of turquoise. Now, these, these, these Gestalt laws um, are, are not just about figure grand separation. They, they do apply much more broadly. For example, take this image here on the left. Probably you are seeing five different columns of uh, circles. So you see one column right here where you're grouping all the dark green um, circles. And this is a separate column, so at least feels like a separate column um, because the color of, of these circles, it's slightly different. So these two columns just seem to be separate and, and the coloring kind of spontaneously leads you to group differently uh, these circles. Uh, I mean, look, why don't you group them as rows where one is dark, one is bright, one is dark, one is bright, one is dark. You could have grouped them uh, mentally as um, five horizontal rows with, cir with circles of different colors is just not what you do. Spontaneously, your mind tends to think that these belong together, and then these belong together, and then these belong together, et cetera, et cetera. In fact, it's such a powerful um, uh, guiding principle that if I were to do this, you are probably seeing a rectangle of dark green squares, and then two columns of uh, bright and dark green squares, sort of separate from the rectangle. And again, it's such a powerful uh, principle that if I do this, you are now probably seeing a square of brown circles. You're not seeing those columns individually anymore the way you were earlier. Now they kind of, they, they're all similar, so they all kind of belong together. And, you know, and we can keep doing this. If I do this, you now see a square made of diamonds framed by sort of a, um, the perimeter of a, of, of a square made of circles. And it's, very, it's immediate that the diamonds belong together and the circles belong together, but they don't mix. Again, you could have seen this as one row of circles and then one row of two circles and three diamonds, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't, you, could, you know what? You could have seen this as diagonals, but you don't. Similarity tends to be an organizing principle in our visual perception. Another, um, another of these laws is referred to as proximity. Things that are together or sort of nearby each other, sorry, tend to be perceived as belonging together. So here, for example, I think again, you are perceiving three separate rows of circles. Of course, why are you? You, sh you shouldn't. You know what? You could have perceived this as, I don't know, um, these kind of slanted triplets of circles. You just don't. That's just not what your mind does spontaneously. And see, again, these are such powerful effects that if I just do this, now you're probably seeing, you know, a group of two that belong together and then these three belong together and then these two belong together and these three, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, and we, we touched on this in, uh, in last week, good continuation. Um, and see, the idea is that when you see this, you are probably thinking that what's happening is that there are these two and they just happen to intersect right here. Of course, why didn't you think of this? You could have. This explanation, these kind of two pointy brackets that meet at the middle, perfectly good explanation of how this was originated. Just not what came to mind. 
It's just not how your mind works. It, your mind didn't think it's two pointy angles that happen to meet at the center. Your, your mind thought it's two lines, they just happen to overlap. You know what? You could have thought this. Why didn't you think this one? You could have thought an infinity of possible configurations that would generate this, these 14 or 15 circles. Yet, yet, I'm, I'm ready to confidently say 99.999999% of you thought this. And it's amazing. Just our minds just come into this world with certain, um, certain principles, certain guiding principles, certain biases or laws, as the Gestalt uh, School of Psychology used to call them, as to how to best interpret um, visual information, particularly when it's ambiguous. Again, this is a way of coping with computational complexity. Here's another principle referred to as closure. Now, if you look at what's happening here, this is a famous image known as the Kanitsa Triangle. And um, now my guess is that your perception of this is that there's a, there's a white triangle and the corners of the triangle are, are occluding three black circles. Now, first, there's no triangle. I mean, you think that you're seeing a line here, but there's no line. If you want, you can print the slides and ascertain yourself of that, but here there's no line and yet you see it. And see, and this is the idea of closure. Your mind is spontaneously closing this shape so to make it sort of continuous and, and smooth, the kind of shape that we would encounter in the world. I mean, look, you could have interpreted this as three little Pac-Men that just happen to have their missing slice or, or mouth, if that's what it is, you know, kind of pointed towards each other. But you just don't see many Pac-Men around, so that's just not how you interpret it. it you, it's much more often that you see circles and triangles, and particularly circles and triangles overlapping to some, some extent on each other, so occluding each other, compared to three little Pac-Men. And you know, and you can make this sort of as fancy and interesting as you want. If you take uh, the middle image, you could have interpreted this as just a bunch of cones or spikes that, that are of different sizes and in different orientations and just that. Instead, I'm guessing that what you're seeing is a sphere with spikes coming out of it. Needless to say, there's no, not only there's no sphere, at best there's a circle which obviously is not there. Once again, you can print this and assure yourself that right here, even though you think you see it, there's no line right here. I know you think you see it. But there's no line right here to close the circle. Our minds, using all these Gestalt principles, take together all the objects there and, tries, and try to make sense of them in the most stable and meaningful and likely way, given the world we live in. Finally, if you look at the one at the right, you know, if I ask you, so what are you seeing? You could say, I'm seeing a bunch, I'm seeing eight circles with sort of each divided in a different way in three little black areas. You could, it's just, that's not what you saw. I'm 100% confident what you saw is a cube where each vertex happens to be occluding a circle. Again, this is the simplest way of organizing this information. And it's very stable. And you know what? You're more likely to encounter in the world the shapes, uh, things made in the shape of a cube that might be partially occluding some other object as compared to a bunch of round circles that are sliced in, in several different ways. And see, once you put together all these, um, all these principles, you can get some pretty complicated things. For example, look at this image. Do you see anything? I mean, you could look at this image and just interpret it as a bunch of black splotches on, I'm guessing, a white background. It's just a bunch of little splotches here and there. However, there is something in this image, or at least I see something. And if you've never seen this, Enjoy this moment because I don't think you'll ever be able to unsee again what I'm showing you. So if you want to enjoy it a little longer, pause the video. Um, but in fact, let me help you. 
I think that right here, there's a Dalmatian dog that is sniffing the ground. The snout is here. This is a piece of its ear. This is the shoulder. This is the front left front paw. This is the, the right front paw. I think here there's somewhere hidden the left back paw. And here's the right back paw. Maybe there's a little tail right here. Uh, and this, this, this big black splotch, it could be a big black splotch, but what if instead it were, see this? What if this were uh, a tree? And of course, I imagine that uh, above, it means there must be a lot of leaves. And so this is nothing but the, reflect, the, the shadow cast on the ground by the tree. Let me help you here. Okay. So maybe this, this helps you see what is happening. And here, I'll, I'll unshow it for a second. But see, the, the idea behind the Gestalt School of Psychology and the Law of Pregnancy is that thanks to all these principles we've discussed, they all come together to allow us to take something highly ambiguous, such as what you're seeing right here, and organize it in the way that makes most sense given the world we live in.